at Deloitte Global. Um, I am not client facing. We're on the internal side trying to protect Deloitte and all its hundreds of thousands of people across 150 countries. I bring those two stats up because they are part of the reason why I cared about this in the first place. We have to care about all the threats in all the different places of the world because somehow it seemed like everything seemed to matter to us. And if I had to guess with the nature of how supply chains are spidering out, it every conflict might seem like it matters to you all too. So um, prior to that, like Rick said, I was at the International Monetary Fund. So I also there gained an appreciation for all the various ways that different geopolitical conflicts can matter. And prior to that, though, I was in the U.S. Army. And I bring that point up because that's a bias. Everybody comes into their career, their job with a certain background and, and with certain baggage, certain biases, certain beliefs. And so I recognize that. And I've always been trying to find ways to understand and mitigate that bias that I'm bringing in. So for this methodology, I also wanted to share some of the problem statements, like why this came to be. Well, um, I think, uh, I don't think I'd get much disagreement in this room if I were to say, hey, there's a relationship, pretty strong relationship between geopolitics and cyber risk. And in fact, I think it's basically accepted CTI dogma at this point. That is not the, necessarily the case outside of this room. And in, for, uh, for the long time, it was definitely not the case. But when Russia invaded Ukraine almost two years ago, we started seeing that change. And especially with, it changed with like boardrooms and C-suite. They started to wonder, hey, I know Russia has a lot of cyber capabilities because I see it in the Wall Street Journal. Like, could they do cyber attacks that could impact us? They started asking a lot of questions probably to many of you, because I know that I heard the rumblings and the slacks and chats of the world. And because I was getting those same questions and my team was getting the same questions as well. And recognizing my American bias and the way that I think about things, like I didn't want to jump in to say like, oh yeah, there's probably this or that. I, I first thought like, hey, let's, let's take a step back and let's see what frameworks and methodologies exist that could help us one, understand what all the potential risks are. And then two, start looking elsewhere because about six months later, other questions started coming up. It's like, hey, I'm seeing these tensions elsewhere. Like, could this be a risk to us? And hey, another three months later, hey, there, there, there's another hotspot popping up. Like, like, what about this one? And I realized like, it, it, it's always better for us to be proactive and get out ahead and understand all of the potential hotspots, all the potential risks ahead of time. And so I found that there isn't a framework for that either. So that was what I tried to do is go and create a framework for that. Now, I'd say two things. First, if you know of a framework that's out there, please let me know. I just because I couldn't find it doesn't mean one doesn't exist. It just means I didn't do enough Googling. And two, this is a model. It's been said, and I fully agree with the statement that all models are wrong, but some are useful. This is probably wrong. And in fact, I even speak about how it's wrong. Like, I know it's wrong. So you're, you're, you're getting like version one. So I'm sorry. But um, my hope and prayer that is that this can be useful for everybody here. So first, I want to start off with some of the perceptions that I baked in. And you, you can also just say assumptions that I baked into this model. First is that we're trying to narrowly scope cyber to just geopolitical conflict, just tensions. Because there's a, a, otherwise you could have cyber war meet anything and it could get out of control very fast. The other thing is that we find that um, destructive and disruptive attacks play an outsized role when it comes to these types of tensions. And I've got a, a slide that kind of shows why I think that just now after this. And, and similarly, we assume that espionage, which is kind of persistent in a lot of places, will uh, you, you'll see that threshold, that noise floor raise substantially correlated to geopolitical tensions. Um, the last thing that you might find um, uh, interesting about the way that I'm talking about it is I don't factor information operations in very highly. And part of the reason for that is unless you are a like social media company or in the news media, there's not a whole lot of like disinformation and misinformation directly targeting private sector companies. Honestly, we, we see the majority of it just going after large population centers as opposed to like individual companies. There, there's like one or two anecdotal examples of how companies can be targeted. But again, very, very rare from what I've seen. So that's why it doesn't play feature prominently in here. Part of the reason why I felt like 
uh, destructive attacks are important is, as you see the graph on the left, uh, that is based on research that our the Deloitte client facing Intel team, shout out to you all, you guys do great work. Um, they, in, in like the early stages of the Russia Ukraine war, they went and looked at all the wipers in history that they could find and did some really excellent research mapping out what year they came in and the different numbers of, mal of wiper families by year. And, and as you see, the first one that they found was 98, 1998, you know, before some people in this room were born, right? Um, and since then, we've um, seen the numbers have been trending up, but you see that big spike in 2022 there. Now, a couple of things to pull out about that graph, that asterisk, that's just up through April. There were a lot more that, you know, others identified later on in the year. And you, you see the orange part there, that's Ukraine. So you see that they saw like, the spike in 2022 was directly tied to that conflict. Crossrike saw similar uh, stuff as you see in their 2023 report on the right, high level of disruption attacks and espionage was kind of high and persistent throughout. Um, I, I do think like the, the change in activity over time is also something that's really interesting. And I'll bring that up at the tail end of the talk. So let's dive into this framework. And the way that I see things, in order for there to be relevant risk for your organization, you've got to have this overlap of three areas in a Venn diagram. The first is what we're calling armed conflict. Think any geopolitical tension or hotspot where there's the very real and potential risk of militaries clashing. So you have to have that. And then also one of those powers that is some way, one of the nations that's somehow connected to that conflict is also able to be termed as a cyber power, meaning that they possess the capability to project offensive cyber, uh, cyber uh, you know, attacks against their opponents. And still for that to matter to you, your organization has to have some connection to that conflict. And so you have to have that overlap in order for you to have relevant risks. Some of the assumptions that I baked into this is that every country has a certain level of cyber risk. There's a debate, uh, depending on where you are in the world, the noise floor might be slightly higher than others, but there is a just a noise floor of cyber risk everywhere in the world. But when there's a conflict involved, that noise floor raises. And so that's what this is basically assuming. And then on top of that, that noise floor goes even higher when one of those countries is a cyber power. Uh, again, like that's an assumption that I think needs to be tested over time, but at least the initial evidence we've got with the first couple conflicts that we've seen, it, this, this holds true. And then the third one is that organizations that are involved face a, that, that find that they've got a connection or a presence in these conflict zones that have cyber powers face a higher level of risk. Now, it gets almost exponential when an organization finds themselves straddling that conflict, when they've got connections on both sides of it. So something to be aware of that that is a, a, a not just a cyber problem, but it can also be a business problem as a lot of countries. Uh, I'm sorry, companies found themselves having to decide, like, do we want to stay in Russia and Belarus or do we pull out? That, that, that was a not a cyber decision. That was a business decision there. And it's a hard one. So, again, let's talk about the relevant risks. What we try to do here is really identify what are the high level risk statements that we wanted to focus on. And my goal in doing this was trying to be relevant um, outside of cyber, outside of the technical side of folks. So I was my 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 target audience here were either executives, people that do risk management, whether they're in or outside of IT and cyber. And so I use language that I would find in the Wall Street Journal or in the Washington Post or, or pick your, your publication that your executives read. That's what I was using. And tried to go and map events and attacks that we're seeing to this methodology, because then you can run statistics on it. And then by having it mapped to Varus or attack, that also helps you to compare the stats that you're seeing in the conflict to either before or after or to other places during the same period of time to see if there is like to see if the conflict is actually causing a, a, a change in the amount of risk that you're seeing there. You'll all, now, remember I said info operations not highly factored into this methodology. You don't see those risks caught out here. That's a potential gap. And if you are a company or, or organization that like has that as a pretty big risk, you probably want to add something like that. As, as I'll find myself probably adding that in in like V2 of this methodology. All right, so let's dive into the, the facets of this uh, conflict. 
All right, so starting off conceptually, this is how I view, was viewing conflict initially, where you'd have, you know, think country A versus country B. And so my first hope is like, oh, there's lots of, you know, these kind of State Department-like databases and trackers and sites where sometimes they'll even like give you a score for the cyber risk for that country. And so like, oh, great, maybe I'll just find like you know, that and we can use that and then try and see where this works. But then I started realizing that actually that's maybe a little helpful, but it's not all that helpful because what we're really concerned about is the actual conflict itself. That is the thing that I found. Like, this is the glue that holds it all together. Like, this is the point of risk. This is the reason why everyone's concerned. And so we had to go and map those. And then you start mapping out what countries are involved with that conflict. Then you see how are those countries connected to other countries. And so the simple way that I kind of broke it down, and I think that this can be used in like a JSON methodology if you wanted to make it like that, where you've got country A and then ally A1, ally A2, to show that which side they find themselves on a conflict, or B1, depending on what side you're on. And then similarly, you'd have neutral countries that just by virtue of their proximity or close cultural and economic ties find themselves connected to that, uh, that conflict. And ideally, what you do is you would map out every single country in the world by each conflict, what status they are, which side are they on, um, or is it country C or country D? Because sometimes there's like five or six countries that are equally fighting over a given conflict, i.e. the South China Sea. Lots of countries having similar claims on a common body of water. So I was, uh, let me go back a second. So I was trying to find a good source to, that talks about these conflicts. And what I found is that there, um, I, I struggled to find one until I discovered the Council on Foreign Relations Conflict Tracker. And uh, when I looked, this is actually pretty solid. Um, it covers a lot of the major conflicts I was expecting to see. It had the data in, a, in such a format that I could actually easily kind of get it from there to Excel, i.e. best Intel tool there is, and be able to do analysis on it. Um, and it also provided these helpful, as you can see, classifications for conflicts because I'm not a geopolitical expert, though I do play one on TV. And so it was helpful to have someone else's you know, kind of nomenclature for what it, it's like. And what I found is in looking at that, there are actually two that stand out because two are the most relevant for us. And those are interstate and territorial disputes. You know, as, as I looked through all the different conflicts that are there, some just had like, like the criminal violence. There was really no instance that I found where there would be criminal violence that resulted in cyber risk to our organization or really any organization because it's just, it's not talking about in the cyber domain. So those were the two that were most you know, useful. And I was also optimistic that like the level of conflict would, would, would be something that I could use too. But this is where the, the bias comes in. Council on Foreign Relations, great organization, but it's based here in DC and its goal is on shaping US policy decisions and their target audience is US policymakers. So that impact is actually impact to the United States. That's important to know because maybe you find yourself in Europe or East Asia and your view on impact for a given conflict varies wildly from what US policymakers might think that it is. And so it's likely the same for your organization as well. Chances are you would have to have a different view on what the impact is than what they would think. So just take that for what, so know that going in, take it for what it's worth. It might be useful, but it also may be wildly inaccurate for you. Um, so when I just filtered down to those two types, this is what you end up with. There's about what about eight, nine, maybe I can't count um, types of conflicts that are now relevant just based on that one source. Now, what I found is this is also incomplete. There's other areas that could bring out conflict. Uh, again, that maybe the U.S. policymakers and U.S. focused people don't care about, but other parts of the world do. And so, finding different conflict. Um, there's a couple of the conflict trackers, but their data just wasn't structured enough for me to be able to use it in the time that I had. Uh, and there's also a long list of international disputes. Um, and there's some really obscure ones out there too. So I just go to like the, inter uh, the Wikipedia international dispute page and you'll find random islands that people are fighting over. The US and Canada have a dispute over some islands up in like the Arctic and things like that. I had no idea. And who knows, someday that could ever cause a conflict. Th th things you didn't know about, right? But I, this, I find, is a great place to start, where now I have conflicts that I can look at, and I can go to the next point in that you know, next uh, bubble on the Venn diagram and see what countries are tied to these conflicts, and are any of them cyber powers? And so my first thought in doing this is, great, we're in CTI. 
We know all about threat actors. We've got all the information there. So I can just start with my Rosetta Stone, my actor tracker database, and, you know, and, and go from there to what country I've attributed those actors to. And I can maybe, if I wanted to get cute, I'd do like a scoring based on like the count of the actors and like their sophistication, do a little math multiplication, right? And then I end up with like some good stuff. But as I started trying to bring all that together in one simple spreadsheet, because again, who, who doesn't love spreadsheets? I, I started noticing like, wow, there's actually a lot of, a lot of countries that are missing here. I, I was getting around 20 or so countries after I did that kind of conversion um, that had an actor you know, tied to it. And I was like, actually, there's like about, when I was at the IMF, we had 189 countries, I remember, only six that weren't. If you looked at the UN, they kind of, depending on how, because there's different ways of classifying like countries. And so there's about 200 or so uh, based on like the way the UN classifies it. And 20 to 200, that's 10%. I'm pretty sure a lot of the countries that are on the more advanced side have hackers in their militaries. Um, I'm pretty sure like, you know, Bill's talk from, you know, yesterday morning where he showed all the different countries that buy NSO group of Pegasus, like that number's greater than 20. And I don't know of too many, um, you know, APTs tied to Turkmenistan, but they have offensive capabilities, right? Based on what they're buying from elsewhere. And so I needed something else that would allow me to kind of bridge that gap between what offensive capability exists in as many countries throughout the world as there are but more than just what are known for actors. And as I'm searching through, what I ended up finding was, hey, actually there's a think tank out of Europe, shout out to the Hague Center for Strategic Studies. They, in 2022, and then update, they updated in 2023, did a study um, called Cyber Arms Watch, where they were trying to measure and assess the, the transparency of countries based on what they've declared publicly, what they've said, like what, what countries will say either in their cyber strategies or in their, um, just news clippings and things like that, that hey, this is what we can do. This is what we do. This is what we choose to do, things like that. Um, and then they compare and contrast that with what folks like us perceive their capability to be, what they've been attributed by other nations, what vendors have said, things like that. And they do a diff to see how transparent a given country is about their cyber capabilities. That's that top map, you know, the, 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 the green, red, all the, all, all the rainbow colors. And then that's, I, I thought, like, really handy because what they do is they, they got it up to, like, 56, 57 or so countries. Like, I can't remember the numbers, but it's high 50s. And that's a lot better than the 20 that I had and better than the other kind of, like, cyber power indexes that, I, that I'd seen um, by, by other places like Harvard. Great studies, but I, I like more rather than less. And this got me that. And this was focused just on offensive capability, which was exactly what I was looking for. And so I also thought about it for a second. I was like, hmm the declared capabilities and the perceived capabilities, they're, they're kind of measuring two different things. So if I actually, instead of doing the subtraction function like they're doing, instead change it to an addition function, then I can go and get a, a cyber power score. And so that's what I did. And that's what you see in the bottom there. I got an offensive cyber power index. Um, they also didn't have all of the countries that we, I had in a couple of the Rosetta Stones that I was looking at. And so I added those countries in and just gave it as a score of like less than one, um, just by virtue of how it all worked out and ended up having a, a, a much better focus. Now, now, the thing that I'd call out here, this is a great, glass is half full. This is a great opportunity to see our, as a community's collection gaps. Like how many of the countries that are like dark colored, do we have some kind of zoo animal, you know, you know APT naming convention for, right? I think there's a, there, there's a lot that we simply don't, but we as a community could well benefit from having that. So, so shout out to all the vendors, start looking in all these places, please. Um, also by having this, and, and, and I think you still need to look at the actors. You can't just settle for a score. Actors are really, really important because that's how you take this methodology and make it practical, make it actually applicable to all the defenders and to everybody else that's gonna actually do something with this. So the way that I would start is you, you, you remember those risk statements that we had, you break it down by type of actor, and then you start filling in for all the actors you have, what kinds of risks are they going to do? Now, you could just as easily go and map this in your database or give, you know, the, the, the formatting can be all kinds of different. But the really important thing is you tie the actors to the risk statement that you expect to see in a given conflict. And what, what, what I'd recommend starting off is you just start with what you know. But right now, these actors have done these kinds of attacks. 
and, and, and we're going to talk shortly about like who they do it against. But you just have that mapped. And then as you go in and you look for a conflict, you can then at least use this as the minimum baseline, uh, recognizing that they will likely do more, both more in quantity and more in type. So for example, if a um, actor has the ability to go and steal sensitive data, but they've never been destructive or deleted anything, it's because they've never had the need to. In a war setting, they may not care. They, they may not self-restrain or they may be tasked to go and like, now that you've gotten in, start deleting things. So it's easy to go that next step. And war gives them that pretext and gives you that understanding of why they might choose to do that. So I, I, I call that out quickly. Now let's make it personal. So like the third thing, how do you tie it to your organization? So we go back to that conceptual map and it's important to know in for a given conflict, how am I connected? Some of the ways that I think you can look at it is how many people do I have in that in these countries? Where do I have offices and how many offices? What about my critical IT type equipment, such as where do I have data centers? How many domain controllers are in these countries? How many, you know, Active Directory, you know, my critical applications, all those things. Where are they in relation to this conflict? Uh, the other thing is how are my third parties and my clients in my broader ecosystem of partnerships how do they factor in are they you know do i have vendors and things in these countries that matter how many and what industries hold on the industries that's going to be the next slide so we want to have all this and it's really important now you might be looking at a given conflict and say hey this is great other side of the world i have nothing not a single thing well, we don't have a presence there we're not connected at all this is great until somebody in your organization says something online Either you make an official statement related to the conflict saying we support country A, or someone that's making an unofficial statement, but they're high enough up in your company that the actors that be related to country B see that you're supporting country A, and they take it as your that person's company is supporting country A, now you've got a target on your back. And so my, the pro tip, recommend monitoring um, monitoring for, for chatter related between like your company and a given conflict to see what statements are out there that could be tied or potentially associated to you. So that's one of the things I'd recommend doing. Um, remember I said industries, you want to look at industries because this is one of the ways that you can kind of tie in and understand the, the potential connections between your organization, kind of like these indirect connections between your organization and, and the risk in a conflict, right? So these two graphs are from uh, Microsoft's report. Microsoft did a wonderful report um, this past year as they looked at the uh, first year of the Russia-Ukraine war. The graph on the left, the one in yellow, is the industries in Ukraine that were targeted during that first year of the war. The one in the blue, the best way to think about it is uh, friends of Ukraine or people that Russian-related or uh, Microsoft-assessed Russian nexus actors targeted potentially connected to Ukraine during that time frame. And what you see is a lot of, first, similarity between the targeting. A lot of things that we might expect, government was the top target, critical infrastructure, next highest after that. So like your, your telco, your transportation, energy. Um, and then after that are like the military and the things that are connected to the military, like the defense industrial base. And then just like a lot of variation after that. Um, on the outside of Ukraine, you see some things that you may not have expected, such as like think tanks. That one shocked me. Um, but as I thought about it more, it kind of made sense. Think tanks are writing recommendations to policymakers in various countries. And they also do a lot of track two dialogues where they'll go and they'll speak with policymakers and generals and academics in non-official capacities and use that to go and make recommendations and get inside scoops on things. So they can be a wealth of you know, espionage worthy data uh, right there. So um, same for like professional services, third parties being targeted as related to those primary industries. So I bring that up because that was just a Russia-Ukraine war, but this was our understanding and our assessment of the types of industries that are most likely to see targeting in a given conflict. So obviously governments, next most would be your critical infrastructure. Again, nothing shocking here, um, but then like the third parties related to governments and militaries think tanks, and then information sources. So news media, social media in the country. Um, and then also what we, what we would call like flagship companies. So think state-owned enterprises or uh, very large major companies in a country that also have a kind of symbolic 
relationship between that country where if you see that brand you're like oh yeah that's always this country right so always um knowing that because they because of that close association might see themselves with like having a, a target on their back so to speak so the the question for all of us in the room is first are you in one of those industries if so you might be targeted uh directly as a result and then how many on your ecosystem your vendors, your clients, your partners, how many of them fall into these industries as well? Because that then raises that noise floor. It, it raises the chances that you or your organization might be targeted. So let's go and kind of bring this all together. I talked about a lot of things. Let's see how this looks in practice. Okay, so like I said, there's, you start with the conflict. You have conflict one, and in conflict one has two countries. You've, uh, country A and country B are involved, and both of them have industries that you're you know, potentially targeted because the other ones have cyber powers made up of actors. And those actors go and cause risk scenarios against their opponent's industries. Now, both countries also have allies. Those allies have industries and their own cyber power with actors uh, associated as well. And the cyber power also has risk scenarios that go and support the effort of the primary country's cyber power against their opponents' industries and their allies' industries. So allies you know, are at risk of similar, if not the same, kind of risk scenarios as the primary opponent. Now, there's also neutral parties that are involved, unfortunately for them, and they have industries that are at risk of collateral cyber damage, collateral cyber risk you know, kind of coming at them. Now, again, we care about us. We're self-centered in our CTI ways. We want to know about our organization. And so what about us? And so we know now what connections we've got to industries, what connections we've got to these countries. And so we then need to understand what are the relationships and connections that we've got as an organization to these industries, because that affects the kind of risk that we could expect to see. Now, this is all kind of V1 of the model, well, actually like V1.2, but V2, what I hope to do is look at the, the intensity of the conflict itself, because I believe that if you start trying to do math, let's say you've cyber power for score for country A is a five, you might assess that all of the risk scenarios going across are also at a level five. But if the conflict escalates, maybe you do some math on it because it, that, that escalation now amplifies that risk. So instead of a five, maybe it's now at a seven. And, and so now that kind of raises the risk for your organization. Um, but um, there, there's also, it can go the other direction where based on the country's national cyber defense capabilities and, and its resiliency plans, it could dampen that score. So instead of going up to a five, maybe it drops down to a three. Um, and same for your company's resiliency measures and, and, and its controls. Maybe you've got that, you know, that knowledge and you could also like show how that risk can reduce. I found that it's best to let the teams outside of CTI though do that part of the assessment. Uh, we'll, but we would own everything up to that point, I think. So then how we would go about connecting the dots for like risk for us. So you start with those actors uh, for all those countries, you map them to what risk scenarios that they do using that, that handy dandy table that we saw before. And then based on our knowledge of the actors, we then go forward and say what industries that they are likely to target or have targeted and are likely to target during this conflict. We assess our connections to those, and then we're able to describe, oh, go back, sorry, y'all. It's describe what risks we are watching for and what risks we're concerned about. So I, I think if you go through and do this, which is a lot of work, admittedly, it gives you some really, really good data. It lets you do a lot of really good things. And what, is, what do we all wanna do? Make pretty dashboards. And so what, what, what you can do with something like this, if you have all the right data, is you can make something that looks like this, where you've got a map that admittedly, it is not as cool as a Pew Pew map. At least this one could be more useful. Um, this is something that can help spur on discussion with uh, senior leaders and help kind of drive you know, better risk assessments. You can focus on things like, what are the top conflicts? What are the top risks, top actors? Um, and I think that is much more helpful and useful for everyone going forward. Um, so some of the opportunities, like once you have this, once you have this data, you know, once you have the, um, all, all this put together, like I said, better risk assessments at the strategic level, um, better opportunity to facilitate tabletop exercises uh, also at that level and, and help 
because we've got all that data on the back end, if you've done this work, you can be pretty robust and pretty solid in that. Again, because you've also tied it to threat actors, now at the more operational level, you're able to help them with the different techniques that have, they've been known to use and the, and the specifics because of all the reporting you hopefully have you know, got available to you. And so you can help provide the threat hunting team with proactive hunting so that they can go and identify these risks and attacks before they end up hitting in your environment. Um, additionally, that allows for follow-on assessments of your controls and how well your company would hold up in the face of some of these things. This is great for the you know, business continuity, disaster recovery type planning support. Now, it's also great for us. Let's be selfish for a little bit here. This can be great for CTI where we are just looking at, like we can identify collection gaps and we can go and improve uh, because we've got the data, we can go and start doing using structured analytic techniques to have some really solid, reliable forecasts. And um, additionally, when you now know where to look in the world and who to be looking at and what you're looking for, you, you can set up some pretty good indications and warnings as well. So you can kind of get out ahead and you can kind of see this coming and warn people in advance. So some of the quick lessons learned here, this is a lot of work, a lot of fun, definitely glad I did it, but it's also... Um, I didn't show, I, I didn't come out of it with any like, oh my God, I didn't know that findings. Perhaps that's because I baked a lot of my assumptions in, um, but I, I would say that this is not for everybody. I find it most useful if you're a big organization that's got a large team in house or you're an MSSP or, or you've got a high risk profile. So just know that in advance. Then the next thing I'd say is no two wars are alike. So let that temper your confidence. Uh, your, your, your confidence. Um, and I've got some other gaps here like info ops and uh, also uh, opportunities for study here. I think there's lots of, um, the, for example, like, like the difference, different risk profiles for industries is something that it, it, you know, warrants a lot more study. Um, I, I'm curious about why some of those industries were targeted more than others. That's something that I think if we were to look at more deeply might draw out some insights. So um, all these resources will be in the slides as you see them. And with that, I want to thank you all. Um, I don't know if Russia and Ukraine was the first cyber war, um, but it will certainly not be the last. So let's prepare now while we can. Thank you. It looks like we'll have time for a couple questions and then we'll move on to the next. Um, actually, Let's go to the room first. Is there anybody, anybody in the room that has any questions? I've got about five or six in Slack. Hello, hi. What's the difference between a cyber war and a cyber conflict? So right now, I'll, I'll be honest, I probably use those interchangeably, but a war is just a like, there's an actual war declared between countries, whereas a conflict, it's uh, you know, below that threshold. Okay. All right, let's go to one that's in Slack. Um, this is uh, from Ross. Is armed conflict a recency bias when looking at geopolitical conflict? I think there's some good observations. If you look at the majority of instances of um, CNA, uh, they happen to be outside of active armed conflict. So TV5 in France, Sony, Saudi Aramco, Olympic Destroyer, also also organizations targeted and disrupted because of geopolitical tensions. So I, so I would definitely agree with that. I think that there's a lot of, you know, recency bias kind of baked into that, but all the things that he named are kind of the one-off examples. And um, what we saw with like, with Russia invading Ukraine is there was a lot of those a lot more examples packed into one small area, one small thing, and thus the risk of a lot of like follow on uh, kind of knock on effects. And, and that I think was what had a lot of people concerned. And I, I especially as every other nation in the world kind of wakes up and sees like, oh, wow, yeah, this is this is, has the potential to be really powerful. And they start getting these kind of capabilities. I think, I, I think about it like this. In World War One, only a small handful of countries had anything like an air force. And then you look at the actual impact of air power in World War I, it was negligible. In fact, you, you, you could argue that you got just as good a reconnaissance from hot air balloons as you did from planes, but wasn't the case in World War II. Air power was dominant. Like people learned in 25 years later, 
that was a massive thing. So I think what we're seeing now is like the early stages of offensive cyber capabilities. And as the world starts becoming more networked, as more and more things are smart, it was, we, it, it, I think there's a much greater incentive for countries to invest and build offensive cyber capabilities. And so while that number of what we've got is like 50, which is a quarter of the world's countries, in 20 years time, I think that number is going to double or triple. So it's that's really why it's a concern. Yeah. I like that. It's a good analogy. Also a really good show on World War II uh, bombing right now. Mm -hmm. uh, just came out last weekend if you're interested in that stuff. Uh, let's go. Final question in the room on the right. Thank you for the great presentation, Lincoln. I'm curious if you could speak a little bit about uh, bringing input from executives in the organization or other business units and how to sort of proact proactively answer some of their questions uh, based on their input. I guess, how do you facilitate those conversations? Absolutely. No, that's, that's a great question. And um, so two ways. First, I, I recommend having executives as part of your stakeholders for PIRs. And so hopefully that comes out in your PIRs. Uh, the other thing that executives have, uh, priority intelligence requirements, thank you. Um, so executives also have a much higher level view of the organization and a lot more knowledge at times of how your company is connected to other companies in other countries. And so they'll have nuggets of wisdom and information about our risk that you just won't know until talking with them or talking with the people that are talking with them. So um, I, I, if you don't have access to the CEO, the people that are however close you can get, try and ask them about what the different kind of risks are, what the different connections are that they're seeing. And I remember going through these kinds of exercises and being surprised at all the different potential ways um, that, that connections existed. And, I, and if I had to guess, I think all of you would, would if, if you go through this effort, you'll find the same, same thing. One thing I'll add on, and then we'll, we'll move on to the next is I would talk to the risk committee, even if you're a public or private company, there will be a risk committee. If you're a public company, you can look at the form 10 case um, and find out you'll learn a lot about business risk that we don't mm -hmm. necessarily think about um, from the cyber side. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Lincoln. It's good to thank have you, you back again. Thank you.